The, uh, the name of this session is From Healthy Soil to Healthy Food Systems, Growing Greater Sources of Health, Economic Value, and Community Well-Being. Uh, a small, narrow topic. Uh, we, I've, I've been in this county about 35 years um, and come from Ohio and a farming community. Uh, and it's been absolutely wonderful to have found home and this nourishment from the land here, just as I found in the Midwest. And I've come to really appreciate the value of our ecosystems. And I think it's, we're, you know, we're starting to, as a community, really look at, at policy and even the role of the business community in, in, in stewarding this, this wonderful land of ours. So how questions that we're going to address today here is how can Marin continue to build on this rich history of agricultural innovation with organics, regenerative practices, practices that, that nurture our local ecosystems and sequester carbon, have a, a, a more holistic, wide view lens on the, the farming uh, community um, and practice? How do we increase productivity and resilience? How do we do it on a much larger scale, right? So increasingly, when I speak uh, to, to business leaders and, and government leaders, it's we're doing some really innovative things here. How do we scale that? How do we export it? Um, how do we create um, protocols and practices and outreach to, in fact, get these practices adopted elsewhere? So. You know, how do we also couch these practices in ways that other communities can, can adopt them? How do we hear how others might do it, and how do we build connections? So what do we want to accomplish today? Uh, a deeper understanding of how Marin can continue to build on this history. Uh, and, and that can, in fact, nurture our local ecosystems, sequester carbon, again, have a, a broader view of farming. Awareness, how we can do it on a larger scale. Uh, ID of identification of some potential opportunities for businesses, other organizations, to better serve our customers, our employees, our suppliers. Um, if you all have then uh, comments collectively or ideas around uh, programs or incentives, resources for further action, we're going to tease those out. Um, and then, of course, we want you to make connections with not only these this amazing panel, but among yourselves. So the format is going to be that we'll, we'll have uh, about 10 minutes of, of uh, prepared talks from our panelists. Um, we're then going to um, take some Q&A, but we really want to, at a table level, really discuss how those ideas are impacting you, what you thought about them, what do you take back home, what are impediments to um, implementation of some of those things, right? So we, we have about 20 minutes there in the, uh, at a table level. Love to have a scribe then take notes. Um, and then we'll finish the session with a, a broader discussion of the whole room. Does that make sense? We'll collect that information. Um, we're going to report out um, not only video but, but uh, on, on paper so that we can archive some of this. We can take this wisdom of the crowd and, and, and propagate it and uh, allow you to, to, uh, to tap it a little bit later. So that's the, the program. Does that make sense? OK, good. Well, Heather, why don't you go ahead and, and start then? Oops, probably, probably need that. That helps. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Mark Squire. Mark is one of the owners of Good Earth Natural Food in Fairfax and in Mill Valley. Um, he's also on the board of the Organic Trade Association, which is a national uh, organization that manages um, the whole organic industry, really, and has a great uh, perspective from that work. Mark is also very grounded in organic farming because he is the owner of Terra Firma Farm in Petaluma, and um, so he lives what he works, what he thinks about. Um, so thanks for being here, Mark. Mm, thanks. Yeah, I'm learning a lot as a new farmer. I had to ask, what is a new farmer? And uh, they actually say that a new farmer is somebody that's only been farming within a 10-year thing, which I thought was great, because it's definitely take, I've been two years at it, and I'm just, just getting started. But um, So I was going to talk a little bit about the uh, 
how organic fits into the greater ecological system, but um, you know, organic sometimes gets a real bad rap, but I always wanna say that uh, the organic, the USDA organic program, I believe is one of the uh, really strong remaining, truly democratic systems that we have. Uh, you know, I think when we went to the USDA and asked them to regulate organics, uh, no industry had ever gone to and asked for regulation before. So it, it, you know, after they stopped falling off their chair, we then said, yeah, but we want it to look like we want it to look. And so we were able to kind of build in a whole bunch of protections uh, to make sure that organic wasn't bought out by big corporate interests or whatever. So, uh, you know, in this day of, uh, you know, anti-government, I feel like it's always important to kind of that we own we owned the organic system with its flaws and uh, everything else. But so organic, um, I just, I don't know if folks just saw this. This just came out uh, a couple of days ago. French study, uh, they compared uh, people that were eating an organic diet five years long, 25% uh, fewer cancers in the people that were eating organic food. So uh, those that are in the industry, you know, kind of realize that, well, you know, we're putting pesticides that we know are cancer causers on our food. We know they're uh, endocrine disruptors. Well, it sort of makes sense that we're gonna start to see this kind of uh, data. It's important to note that the study was uh, done by the French government. And um, so it was not done by industry. And that's, you know, increasingly you gotta pay attention to that because there's so much disinformation out there, studies that are, funded by the um, chemical industry that are coming up with all kinds of strange results, as you might expect. Uh, so I'm gonna talk mostly today about uh, organic and the environment, though. And one of the things, this comes out of uh, Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, and uh, one of the things that he came up with was that, you know, a third of all the greenhouse gas emissions are from our food system, and 80% of those are from agriculture. And I think that's, there's two reasons for that. One is that the agriculture systems that we've had in place have been pulling vast amounts of carbon out of soils and into the atmosphere. And uh, of course, the other side of that is that we've gotten away from the parts of agriculture that are actually putting carbon in the soil. Um, so when you think of organic, usually people are always thinking about what is not in our organics, the pesticides, uh, GMOs, all the artificial flavors and all that's true for sure. But, um, you know, the organic laws have built into them some real basic soil uh, re building requirements. And sometimes people forget that. But uh, really, you know, the way organic agriculture works is that it relies on uh, fostering natural systems, which are soil bacteria, uh, composting, cover cropping, you know, it's not just, you know, you don't get away with doing organics by just removing the chemicals, that doesn't work. It, it, the whole system crashes when you try that. It really works because organic farmers for years have been, um, you know, doing those soil enrichment uh, programs uh, that are giving them yields and making the whole system work, making their uh, plants more resilient to insects. And uh, I think there's a lot of analogy between organic agriculture and human health, you know, where it's like, if you go and eat McDonald's every day, guess what, your immune system suffers. Pretty soon you get some diseases, pretty soon you're at the pharmacy trying to get some drugs to fish yourself out of it. And the same is true with agriculture, you know, as we have uh, killed all the soil bacteria in our so soil systems, and um, depleted our soils, we're ending up with these plants that don't survive without the chemical intensive pesticides on them and all that. So it's, it's a really different way of looking at agriculture. Uh, and it's important to note that, but the organic system has some real basic uh, soil stuff built right into it. This is uh, actually my farm and uh, um, uh, pictures of, sorry, it doesn't show up that well, but the, uh, that's our compost operation. And I've been, since we've been at Terra Firma and building compost, I've been telling the, you know, people that every grocery store should have a farm relationship building compost with them because it's just lovely to see all our waste 
that happens, we, we also have chickens and pigs, so they eat some of it. What doesn't end up with them ends up in our compost. And then I have oodles of compost to spread on the pasture land as well as, uh, you know, I have winter squash now at Good Earth and uh, um, a few other crops. Um, so compost is one of the keys for sure. Uh, through putting compost on soils, uh, we are putting huge amounts of carbon in. And again, it's, uh, you know, I think some of my uh, cohorts here uh, will go into that maybe more, but for sure it's the Marine Carbon Project that started that really happening. I still remember being at the Eco Farm three or four years ago and listening to John Wick do his numbers of, okay, half an inch of compost on rangeland soils, the amount of carbon that that puts in, it's like, uh, you know, huge levels. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is that we have the tool through organic agriculture and uh, organic pasture land to sequester enough carbon to save the day. But it's going to take us really, uh, you know, doing that. Um, so this is a, a study that was came out last year that just, basically compared organic farming the way it exists right now um, nationwide you know seven about 700 farms conventional 700 farms organic and they looked at the carbon that was being sequestered in those systems and quite dramatic results so they're the numbers um, um, you know I, I looked at those numbers and I you know the way I'm I am I always kind of had to kind of sit down and I did for a couple hours uh, with a pencil and kind of went, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Because 13% uh, is a lot, but, uh, so I, I took those numbers and, you know, basically extrapolated them. Okay, if that's the amount of carbon, then what is it, you know, I wanted to know what does that mean to an average person? Um, so that's how many acres, 389 million acres of farmland uh, in the country. It was 11,000 pounds of carbon extra that was put into soils through an organic system per acre. Uh, so that's extra, not just that much. So what that, uh, that results in that 4.3 trillion pounds um, sequestered, and um, which results in about one-sixth the amount of carbon that is released in the United States per year. Uh, so that's from uh, switching off, switching from a conventional diet to an organic diet for one person. That's assuming an acre per person. And actually, one of the interesting things I came up with in those numbers is uh, another thing that's highlighted in um, um, Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, is that it, it actually, the difference between acreage per vegans and uh, regular American meat-eating diets, it was about two acres for a meat-eating diet and about a half an acre for a vegan diet, which, uh, so I averaged an acre is what I did there. And that results in about um, um, taking four cars off the road for a year. That's the equivalent carbon from changing your diet to an organic system. Um, so, um, this is a little bit, uh, sometimes people think that the carbon uh, in ag land is more about tillage than it is about uh, putting carbon in. And uh, the science is uh, really mixed about that, but there's uh, some of the newest science is actually, well, m maybe I'll say that some of the, the reason people thought that was because when they were looking at carbon in soils, um, comparing tillage versus non-tillage, they were basically looking at the first six inches of soil. And um, what we now know about carbon in soils is that there is carbon stored more than a meter deep. And uh, a lot of that has to do with when you put compost on soils, the root structures get healthy, they go way down, they're, they're um, talking to the fungi way down, and they're, they're putting a lot of carbon real deep in the soil. So when they, um, actually the newer studies that are looking at the carbon a, a meter down are showing that organic systems, even with tillage, are actually uh, putting more carbon in the soils than the no-till conventional systems that exist. So 
you know, there's a lot of people in the organic world kind of going like, well, maybe we can do organic no-till too, which is, uh, but there's a lot of research that's needed about how to do that because the, um, the no-till conventional systems are all using glyphosate to kill the weeds. So there's issues there. But at any rate, uh, organic is definitely a solution there. So um, that's pretty much uh, what I got. I, you know, when I look at these numbers myself, um, I kind of go like, well, why aren't, why isn't the whole country eating organic right now? And uh, so that's maybe the question I leave you with, is why not? And uh, um, I think the, um, the short, sweet answer to that, I think, I think that organic has suffered a lot with the same problems that the um, solar industry suffered with, which is that it's hard to monopolize. And that may sound like a funny thing, but you know, if you put solar on everybody's roof, there's no uh, way that the, you know, some big corporation can own that. And, uh, but I think that will change. So thank you. Just gonna switch slides over. Um, I didn't introduce myself yet. I, my name is Heather Podal. I work for a nonprofit organization based here in Marin County called Fibershed. Uh, we build regenerative regional textile economies. Uh, we're kind of in the category, if you were here in the last session uh, when Kevin Bayouk was giving an overview about reinventing the whole idea of how business is structured and supply chains are structured. That's, that's kind of how we fit in. Um, in terms of a, a whole new approach to something. So I'm gonna pick up the thread that um, Mark left us with on looking at the potential for agricultural systems to sequester carbon, but I'm gonna put a little different frame around it um, going on uh, kind of the, the framework of what Fibershed's focus is. There we go. So Fibershed, um, how many people in the room have ever heard of Fibershed? Oh, yay, that's wonderful. Um, so if you haven't heard of fiber shed, just in terms of a definition of terms, uh, fiber shed like a watershed or a food shed is a, is a way of looking at a strategic area, strategic geography that's the basis for a natural resource and saying what's, what's possible here, how can we create a healthy system? Um, so we use it um, just as a noun in general use and then it's also the name of our organization. Um, like I said, we're based here in Northern California. This is uh, where our, our flagship community is. Uh, our producers in this region are a big focus of the work we do, but we also have now uh, 50 communities around the globe that are affiliated with us who are doing similar work in their own regions, in their own communities. Uh, these are some images from our Northern California producer community. Uh, we have 150 members of the Fiber Shed Producer Program here. Uh, and that includes people who raise wool, like Lauren, who's going to speak next. Uh, people who raise cotton, like Sally Fox, who's um, on the side picture there, who um, I'm grateful to be wearing uh, her cotton in my shirt and my skirt today. We have sheep shearers and knitwear designers, people who spin wool, uh, people who work at a hand scale to, to um, create felt and, and knitted garments, and we also have people in our, in our community locally now who are weaving on an industrial scale. And so that's very exciting that we are starting to put the pieces back together for a whole system. But it really takes, in the fiber system, it takes a lot of people involved, a lot of different parts to take raw material coming off the landscape and put it into a form that we can wear on our bodies or use in our homes. Um, so just to take a moment to, to kind of make the point of why we would want to reimagine the way that we are getting our clothing or other textiles that we use in our daily lives uh, is really just um, starts with the idea that the way that we are all generally getting our clothes in the United States and around the world is not, it's not a sustainable use of resources. Uh, by the year 2050, according to a study that came out last year by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, the textile and fashion industry will be responsible for about a quarter of the total global uh, carbon budget. And if we think about that, um, that's just 
ridiculous how much infrastructure is needed in a system that right now, commonly, you'll have raw material coming off of one continent being shipped to another continent for processing back to a third or even a fourth continent before it's made into a final garment. Um, and then it could be shipped from there to, to its final destination. So we're looking at a model that's, that's just reimagining what's possible. And we're, we're kind of, we're starting from where we're at here in Northern California, which I'm gonna tell you is, there's a lot of potential in there, there's a lot of steps. Another thing I wanted to just mention about the way that we're clothing ourselves right now that I think people are hearing a lot about plastic in the ocean, plastic in our environment, and how pervasive that is. A lot of people are not aware of how much of that plastic pollution is actually coming off of our clothing. More and more, our clothing is made out of plastic. This shows the trajectory of polyester and synthetic fiber in global consumption. In the last 20 years, uh, really coming out of a, a whole new approach to fast fashion and cheaper fashion that's become something that feels very normal to a lot of people, but really isn't an, a normal way for us to be getting these materials. Um, the amount of, of plastic blends, synthetic fiber blends, and, and clothing items that we have has really skyrocketed. And the microfibers that come off of these clothing and, and textiles as they're washed in our washing machines are going into our freshwater and marine environments um, to the point where at this point, people are projecting by 2050, we could have a, a greater weight of plastic in the ocean than we have of fish. And some estimates say between 70 and 90% of that is actually microfiber plastic. It's not only the plastic bottles and things breaking down or pellets. Um, it's, it's this continual shedding that these materials are doing. Um, so a question you might not have asked yourself before is, what carbon pool are my clothes coming from? As, as we're grappling more and more with the impending changes and the need to take action on climate, we need to educate ourselves as a society about what is the carbon cycle and how are we interacting with it on a daily basis. The, the things that we're eating, the things that we're clothing ourselves with, the, the materials in our lives have a big role in the carbon cycle. And when we wear natural fibers that are coming off of the land, we're, we're drawing down carbon just by virtue of wearing something that was carbon dioxide before it became a grass, before it was transformed into wool. But we also have the potential in that system to have a huge impact on the, on the overall carbon budget by supporting land use practices that are sequestering carbon. So Fibershed is very interested in the question on a regional level of what is possible here. A few years ago, we did a study across the state of California sampling the, the wool that's coming out of, um, we directly sampled about a third of all of the wool producers in the, in the state to look at what is the fineness of their wool. That's what determines how soft wool is. You've probably experienced, um, you can buy very soft merino wool that feels good next to your skin. You can also, um, get a wool sweater that's very itchy, not quite as soft. So the fineness of the actual wool fiber determined by the breed of sheep that's adapted to a certain landscape determines um, what the best use for that fiber is. So we wanted to understand how much fiber do we have available for this resource uh, in our communities and what's the quality, what could we use it for? And we found that of the four million pounds of wool coming off of the landscape in California, which is one of if not the highest, one of the highest states in the, in the country producing wool, we have uh, almost a million pounds of wool that is of a, of a fine enough micron count, of a, of a fine enough quality to be worn next to skin. We really could be clothing ourselves with the, the products of this landscape. Um, and then we have an incredible amount of wool that could be used for all kinds of other products that we could use in our lives. And the truth is that a lot of this wool is not being used. Um, especially the coarser wool is largely uh, going into compost piles, sometimes even going into landfills because the, the demand and the price for wool um, has been so low that um, this, this resource is often being underutilized or not utilized. So in looking at this, we're, we've focused on wool quite a bit in, in our region because this is such a big part of what fiber is available to us here and trying to understand both what we could create in terms of serving our needs for a material good, but also 
what, what, how can we build a system around this, a whole supply chain that goes back to building carbon in the soil? Um, you might recognize on the left-hand side our next speaker, so he's going to pick up some of the pieces that I have to jump through really quickly. Um, but Fibershed is working closely with, an, we're so lucky here in Marin County to be kind of the epicenter of a lot of research on carbon sequestration, on what land use practices really have the potential to do to draw down carbon. We've lost in California about half of the carbon that originally was in the soils here um, before Europeans came to California. When the landscape was dominated by perennial plants, uh, we had a much a double the, the carbon in our soils is the estimate. And we can put that back if we, if we know how to go about doing the right practices. This is a list of about 30 practices from the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service that have all been shown scientifically and modeled out uh, to enhance carbon capture. And um, there's actually numbers that we can attach to certain practices on certain soil types in different areas and understand what the potential is of implementing those practices. And we're going to hear more about some of them. Um, starting in our producer community, still un starting to want to understand what's possible here. What, what could we really do if we activate a supply chain that takes raw materials off of our landscape and supports uh, farmers and ranchers to implement these practices? We developed a partnership with a lab at UC Davis who's running soil samples on a number of uh, ranches. Now we have about 40 of our, of our uh, producers who are involved with this soil sampling process. And based on the, the first round of results that we've gotten looking at what, what is the soil current carbon content within our producer community, um, on this first batch where those 40 producers are managing about 10,000 acres, by increasing the soil carbon content by 1%, which is doable, it's, it's, uh, it's aspirational and it's totally doable, um, we could offset the emissions on that land area of about 118,000 cars and add about 285 million gallons of water holding capacity to those soils. Carbon and water are very tightly linked. And this speaks to how uh, increasing carbon sequestration in these supply chains is not just something that someone can do because they want to help someone out there who's suffering from climate change. It's something that's very immediate um, and can be very beneficial right here in our community where we, we want to increase the health of the soils and we need, to, we need to hold on to that precious water. So we've developed a, a program called Climate Beneficial Wool. Uh, this is a a very carefully constructed set of um, planning that a, a farmer or rancher can go through to understand what would be most appropriate on their land base, what practices uh, match best with what they're trying to do in their operation, and and what's available to them, and then what has the big, what could have the biggest climate impact. And after cr creating a plan, they start implementing these practices uh, and. We're working with them to help connect them with end users and with brands. So I want to just quickly touch on two different examples of prototypes that have come out of that kind of supply chain. One is a, a ranch in Northeast California that has very fine wool. So this is one of the ranches actually we, we got in contact with through the um, wool survey that I told you about. And we connected them with the North Face. And last year, the North Face came out with this hat that they marketed as a climate beneficial product. Uh, so the, the Bear Ranch in Surprise Valley created a carbon farm plan, comprehensively understood on their ranch what they could do to increase carbon sequestration. And through the, the very careful modeling that's been done by USDA and some other research studies, we were able to understand that they're capable of sequestering six to nine times the amount of carbon that their, that their sheep uh, operation releases in its normal functioning. Like Mark said, all agricultural activities have a footprint. But, but because we did this planning process with them, we could see that the footprint um, that they're having could be offset six to nine times. And I just wanted to show you that last year the beanie was so successful that the North Face created a, a jacket this year. Um, we're really excited about these products because this is, this is really something new to have something coming out of a, a process with a rancher 
and, and I'm so excited that Lauren's going to speak next because he has a lot more uh, personal experience with all of these. But to, to be able to have products that are coming off of these landscapes, um, whether it's food or fiber, and, and it's a little bit harder to get these fiber products uh, onto our shelves. Um, so I'm actually going to just show you this picture with Lauren's wool and maybe let him mention a little bit about this product. But I have an example of the wool here. There's a bedding company locally that's taking his products and making them now into mattress toppers. You can buy them here. So this is something coming off the landscape in Marin, being sold in Marin, um, coming through this climate beneficial supply chain. And I'll just leave you with this, um, this schematic of what our vision is for how this whole system can work, a, a climate beneficial supply chain that actually brings, um, brings funding from a combination of sales, uh, proceeds from the climate beneficial sales, also donations and price premiums, and feeds it back to farmers uh, who are raising those products, putting it into the processing. We really can create the supply chain, but we need more investment in infrastructure, um, and we need people to think about how their own personal consumption can, can offset or, or inset is actually um, an even more powerful term than carbon offsets. How can we actually change our, our buying patterns in our, in our homes and businesses. Um, OK. So that's, I'm going to pass it on to Lauren. Um, so Lauren is the owner of Stemple Creek Ranch that you may have seen his beef for sale in, uh, at Good Earth and at many restaurants in the Bay Area. Lauren was involved with the Marin Carbon Project from the very beginning, with one of the original ranches that, that took that project on. Um, like I said, I'm really excited about the wool that Lauren's ranch produces and the products that are coming off um, into our fiber supply chain, but um, we're really excited about your pioneering work. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think, can you guys all hear me? I don't think I need this. Okay. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm going to talk into this because they need it for the video. <clears throat> so it's pretty exciting for me to be here and um, meet you guys. And so before the end, of, before I leave, I'd like to shake all your hands personally. But I'm going to talk a little bit about Stemple Creek Ranch. But it's exciting to be up here with a couple of our important partners, which is Good Earth and, and Fiber Shed. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things, and part of my story is um, in order to create positive change, consumers vote with their dollars. And these two organizations are really helping farmers and ranchers like me get to the next level um, doing what we think is good work. So um, that's, that's Stemple Creek Ranch. Let's see here. How do I do this? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna, I have a lot of slides. I'm going to buzz through them fast, though. But Stemple Creek Ranch is located right in the, basically Tomales Bay. We go from Point Reyes. You know, we have different ranches. Point Reyes all the way up. The hub is in Tamales. Actually, a little town called Fallon. I don't know if any of you have ever been out there, even come to the ranch, potentially. Um, but Fallon used to be a booming agricultural metropolis, and now there's about 10 people that live there. But it's, uh, it's a cool spot. I'm actually the fourth generation on the ranch. Angelo is over on the right, the top picture of the right. He immigrated from Garzano, Italy in 1897, and we've been continually farming ever since. I have two little girls now that are six and nine, and hopefully we have an exciting enough business that they want to come back and participate, but there's no pressure. They don't have to, but me, thankfully, and there's a picture of the four generations. That's me, the little baby, and then that's me and my dad, you know, 18 years later. Thankfully for me, I got bit by the bug to come home and be a rancher. There wasn't really a lot of opportunity for me, but the place was still there, and um, we really reinvented the business. So, um, a lot of the things that Stemple Creek Ranch stands for, and we can, we, when we have a uh, question and answer, we can talk through any of these things, but we really have a land ethic. We want the land to be better than when we found it. And that really started way back when with my dad, not just with me. Um, and he uh, started some conservation projects. And at the time, I was 15, 16 years old. And I didn't really understand why he was doing that. But now fast forward, um, the changes that we've made to the property are stunning, and I'll show you some pictures. Um, we're also really thankful for uh, other partners like Malt Marine Ag Land Trust. If any of you 
have ever heard of Marin Ag Land Trust. My dad was one of the founding board members. I was on the board for 10 years, and now actually my wife is on the board. So we're very committed to it. And all the land that we manage in Marin County is protected by an easement. So it's going to be farming forever. Um, we're driven by healthy, healthy for con the consumer, healthy for the environment. And um, some people have said they want me to talk a little bit about the business of what we do and how... It's changed, but basically we had to reinvent the business from traditional agriculture to a direct-to-consumer focus. And, you know, t 10 or 12 years ago, about 10 years ago, we put up our website, stemplecreek.com. You guys should all check it out. And we have Instagram and Facebook, too, so you can check those things out. <laughs> but you can see what we do every single day. But about 10 years ago when we did that, the goal was to just sell enough beef so that we can afford to do it the next year. And now, fast forward 10 years, we're actually selling all we can raise and we're partnering with other farmers and ranchers to produce for us to do it our way and it's becoming a really successful product um, and and real fun business actually it's a consumer brand now so we're excited about that um, this is what the lo ranch looks like in the springtime um, it goes all the way from the top of the hill back to where we're at there um, but every single year we have a seasonal drought and that is really what motivated me to become a carbon carbon farm or the reason why is carbon is like a sponge in the soil. I'm just dumbing this stuff down because it's really simple. Carbon's like a sponge, and it holds water. So it would be like the, the sponge on your kitchen sink. If you, if, you, um, if you actually put it under the sink, it'll be wet unless you wring it out. So what we don't want to do is wring it out. We want to, um, Mark, Mark mentioned earlier, we, we want to increase our carbon by at least 1%. Right now we have pastures that have 4 to 6% carbon. I'm a lofty dreamer, and I think before I'm dead, we'll have 10% carbon. And what that does is for every 1% increase in carbon, we're storing 18 to 25,000 gallons of water. We are dry land farmers out in West Marin, so we take whatever Mother Nature gives us in terms of rain, and we don't want that water to run off of the land. We want it to stay in the land and be stored in the sponge or the carbon. Does that make sense? And at the same time, we're getting all these ancillary benefits of pulling CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it in the soil and helping, helping. But it's financially, it's, it's good for us. We want lots of perennial plants. We want green grass longer. My dream is to have green grass year-round, and we're, we're going to have that because we have forbs and we're, we have lots of biodiversity. We'll talk more about this. So why carbon farming? I want to have more soil for my kids than when I got the place and for my grandkids. Um, market high-quality food, green grass longer, um, make the soil act like a sponge, and be this is the, one of the very single most important points of the whole thing. To be sustainable, we have to be profitable. So um, it doesn't mean anything if we can't af to be sustainable if we can't afford to stay there and operate the business. And this is not a super easy county or state to, to operate a business, but the county is actually gung-ho on agriculture. So we do get a lot of support. Um, the Bay Area is expensive, but we're, we're doing it. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff quickly because I have a lot of slides, but um, the, some of the elements of the carbon farm plan that we've put together, and we can talk more about this after, but compost is one of the key things that we use. We also have planted every riparian area on the property. Riparian areas are places where water flows year-round, and we've planted them all and secluded them from the cattle so the cattle can't go in there. We have five solar pumps that pump water to the tops of the hills. Gravity flows to 40 different water troughs. And we try and mimic what happened in the Great Plains two or 300 years ago where the bison would uh, migrate across the Midwest Great Plains and they would basically eat the grass in front of them, stomp the grass below them, and poop on the grass behind them, then come back six months later and it would be healthy, beautiful uh, grasslands. So that's what we're trying. Uh, we use, there are a couple things that always get people going here is we use a refractometer to test our grass. Refractometer is what the winemakers use to test how much sugar is in the grapes before they pick them to make uh, high quality wines. And our goal is the same as a winemaker. We want lots of sugar in the grass because it helps feed the microbes in the rumen. Cows rumen are amazing. Um, and let's see here, let's skip to that. So that's me just, that's me in the springtime with a handful of grass with deep roots. And we want lots of diversity. So if you look at this handful of grass, there's probably 15 different types of plants in there. And that's good because in the soil, they all build on each other. And they have a party in the soil living off of each thing. Oh, the one thing that I didn't mention on the last slide is we actually even apply seawater to our soil. And people would say, why would you ever apply salt water to your soil? It's not salt water, it's seawater. 
which has about 80 plus different micro minerals, and that helps the soil have a party again. And uh, all the little microbes and fungi that it can actually light them up and and uh, help them create more soil. That's just another picture of the ranch. Um, one of the other big challenges I mentioned earlier is we have <clears throat> half the year we have a drought, so we get all our rain from October to April. The other half of the year we have a drought, so we're planting things like this, which are forbs, chicory. I don't know if you ever have chicory in your coffee, but chicory, plantain, brassica, they're all deep tap-rooted stuff, and this is our property in August with lots of green feed still, um, and if we turn the cattle in there, they would go crazy. So this is what our ranch looked like 25 years ago. That's Stemple Creek. That's why we named it Stemple Creek Ranch. That's looking out the window of my parents' house. And I loved that creek and everything about it. But there was about three trees in there. So what my goal is is to make it the same creek look like this. Beautiful riparian area, lots of biodiversity, lots of different plants and animals living in there along with us. And it's also a huge carbon sink. So basically all of those plants, they, they store carbon. So now this is what the creek looks like. And that's 25 years later, and that what gives me hope is that through education, more and more people can do this type of thing. There's now 35 different types of migratory birds that nest there, and they didn't nest there 25 years ago because it wasn't there. So 1990, 2010, 2018, serious, serious changes. That's the slide you wanted, right? <laughs> um, we make our own compost on farm, and we use lots of other products. We actually, this is our buffalo. These are cows, but they're, it's our way of moving the fences around to get um, the cattle to go where we want them, when we want them to go. And our carbon farm plan is working. If you look on the left, that's our neighbor's property. There's no trees in the creek, and there's no grass in the field. And if you look to the right, we have plethora of grass, plethora of trees. Um, this is the biodiversity stuff. We also have bees, <coughs> bees that we partner with the uh, neighbor. We also do stuff like this, which is in our ponds. We make uh, duck tubes so the mallard ducks can jump up in there and lay uh, their eggs and not get um, their eggs robbed by predators. And then we do lots of farm tours and ranches. I encourage, or tours and events, I encourage you all to come out, check us out. We love to be in contact with our consumers. We believe that if you eat meat, you come out and you see what we're doing and you meet us, you see the land, you see the cattle, and you taste the meat, you're gonna wanna buy it. And hopefully you'll go to um, Good Earth and pick some up. And then, so the four reasons, I'm a, this is my last slide, the four reasons I like to uh, tell our story is one, it tastes better, our beef tastes better. It's better for the land, it's better for the animals, and it's better for the humans consuming the product. So if we can just keep this going over and over and over, more and more farmers and ranchers are gonna do what we're doing, and we're actually gonna see positive positive change. So thank you very much. Oh. Was that my last slide? Oh, I think it was. <laughs> it was I have now. one more slide. Put that back on. Oh, <laughs> I have one more slide I wanted to show you. Here. Sorry. That's all right. It's a little slow. That's my happy place. <laughs> Behind the barbecue cooking, you know, amazing high quality. I think it's coming up. There you go. There All right, that's how we want to end. <laughs> so we're going to end um, going back to the soil fi fiber shed often likes to talk about us being a soil to soil model. And I love that we're ending with compost on the panel um, because it's the ending and it's always the beginning too. Um, so Will Bax is here from Sonoma Compost. Um, I'm gonna read this a little bit. because sure. uh, Will's the co-founder and the co-owner of Sonoma Compost and the project manager at Renewable Sonoma. Uh, he's a preeminent soil scientist who's devoted his life to advancing the composting industry. 37 years of experience and expertise in all aspects of composting. Will is also known for his educational outreach, giving workshops on composting, soil health, and carbon farming. He's adjunct instructor at the Santa Rosa Junior College for the agricultural composting class. So thank you, Will. Thank you. So I've seen people taking pictures of the screen. Um, I put this uh, presentation on my website. If you go to... Um, 
renewablesonoma.com. Uh, there is a uh, link there at the top to the, uh, what is it called, teach or learn, or the learn page. You go to the learn page and you see this picture out there. You click on it and the PDF opens up. So, um, to start, uh, Sonoma Compost. Uh, we started that in uh, 1993, uh, basically as a result of uh, AB 939 that required 25% waste reduction by 1995 and 50% by the year 2000. Uh, we ran the facility uh, till 2015 when it was unfortunately was shut down. Uh, when that shut down, Marine, West Marine Compost came to me and he said uh, they're operating in uh, Nicasio. And he said, well, can you help us out and make our uh, facility a little bit more environmentally friendly? And so, and more successful as well. So I came over there, they carried one compost product and uh, one soil product and that was it. Right now, they have five mulches, four different types of compost, uh, and their production has about tripled uh, at this point. Now, to show that within an existing frame, you can do things that are more uh, carbon-friendly as well. Uh, we wrote for the LaFranchi farm, where we operate, a, uh, a grant to uh, change their manure harvesting system from a flush system to a dry scrape system thereby reducing the methane uh, production of that farm that escapes into the atmosphere by 85%. So that's a really nice model that we established there. And we're getting actually better manure coming out of this. So that will happen uh, probably early next year. That will make a better compost. Then the next phase is that after we were shut down, we said, well, Sonoma, compost, uh, uh, Sonoma County does need uh, a compost facility out there. So we formed uh, Renewable Sonoma. And that's what I'm going to talk about right now, is what I think is going to be the future of the composting industry. So, um, you heard from these other people here that compost really is at the foundation of creating healthy soils, giving them a chance to do the carbon farming in a uh, responsible manner. Uh, at the same time, we have a lot of organic matter going into landfills. And even when you have landfills where they extract methane and use it for, to generate energy, or like in Marin County where they flare it off, uh, methane is still escaping from the landfill. And landfill operators will usually say, it's like, oh, well, we kept probably about 90% of the uh, methane. Environmentalists say, no, you don't, you know, maybe 25, 40%. And in Sacramento, we usually say, like, well, about 20, 75% is maybe captured. That means that 25% goes up in the atmosphere, but it's 86 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So we farm backwards if we have organics going into the landfill. So a bill passed, SB 1383, which requires that there's another 50% uh, of uh, organics being diverted out of landfills by the year 2020, and 75% uh, by the year 2025. That is a tremendous amount of organic matter that has to come out of the landfills. For California, that means that they will need 100 new compost facilities, the size that Sonoma Compost was, and we did about, uh, at the end, 100,000 tons per year. Uh, over our lifetime, we diverted about 1.8 million tons of organics from the landfill. Uh, AB341 uh, uh, also is helping that effort by uh, creating a mandate that uh, commercial operations now also must get uh, a service to recycle their organics. Sonoma County has set a goal of 80% waste diversion, so as a result, we're going to see a lot more compost coming on the market. That also makes the regulators nervous. Water quality board, air quality board, it all goes like, well, all this composting going on, there's emissions coming from compost facilities as well, we need to regulate them. So uh, there's a lot of uh, things in flux at this point. Uh, our goal is, as Renewable Sonoma, to actually maximize how much will be recycled, because the larger our facility is, the more economical it is, we can keep the prices for composting down and make more material available for agriculture. In my opinion, a lot of people are afraid that we're going to see a glut of organics hitting the, uh, the market and there is not enough market for it. If you make a good product, this stuff sells itself and you will not have enough on the ground no matter how big you are. Uh, we made a promise that once we get a contract, and we hope to get a contract early next year, uh, that we're going to start our education and outreach program right away. Even though it may take three years before we have a facility, the ecology is here and they start nodding already, they'll say, because it will take time to educate the public to get used to what they need to do, 
And so by the time we open up, we will have them already at maximum uh, diversion so that we open a facility that actually we get the material that we designed it for. And we also do stuff on uh, contamination control, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So in very short, you know, it's like we get the green can. Uh, it will have yard debris in it and food scraps. On food scraps that was talked about earlier, interesting tidbit out here, some of you may have heard this already, but 40% of the food that we grow is not being consumed in the United States. That's a tremendous amount of food that is just wasted. A lot of it can be reused, can be uh, uh, recovered, and we can feed the hungry with it. Uh, we also need to look at, you know, it's like prevention, it's like make sure that it doesn't rot away. But there was, we still have food scraps that will go into the green can, and of course there's the commercial food scraps. We will take about 40% of what comes in in organics, and it goes into an anaerobic digestion. We're going to do wet digestion. Basically, you have one million gallon tanks that you put a slurry of food scraps with some yard debris in it, and it digests, and it produces methane. Different from a landfill, here we capture 100% of the uh, methane that's being produced in these tanks. Our facility will produce about one to one and a half megawatts of uh, energy coming from the uh, organics. Then the digester from uh, the uh, uh, anaerobic digester is combined with uh, the yard to be goes into a composting system. I go in more detail on all of this here. Then the compost goes to the farm. This year is at uh, Singing Frogs Farm. Any familiar here with Singing Frogs Farm in Sonoma County? I see one hand rising up. Great example for what can be done. Uh, this uh, farm, about six, seven years ago, uh, started doing a no-till organic agriculture. It's about three, four acres. Um, he gets five crop rotations per year, grosses about $100,000 per acre. None of his neighboring farmers are doing this here. He increases organic matter content from about 1% to 6 to 8% uh, throughout his farm. He uses 20% of the water that his neighbors are using by getting that type of production. That, those are amazing results. So here's a picture of uh, what we are proposing to do. And I'm going to walk you through this here to get an understanding of what a modern day comp compost facility would look like. Because the olden days, what I had was basically you would grind material, it goes in these long piles, like you saw what uh, you're doing at your farm. You know, it's like uh, you put like a loaf out there and you turn it and you let nature decompose it. Uh, that doesn't fly anymore. I would not be able to get a permit from the air quality board if I tried to do the same thing right now. So uh, we're getting in several sources of organics. Uh, one is the residential uh, green can that is a mixture of yard debris and food scraps. Then there would be uh, the straight commercial just food scraps. And then there is uh, self haul yard debris and uh, wood scraps. We in general use that particularly applies to this group out here, the self haul if we look at material when they come in, it goes for the highest use uh, first. So if we see wood scraps coming in and the wood is reusable, and quite a bit of it, it is, uh, two by fours, two by sixes, uh, plywood, um, all kinds of materials, we set that aside and we have a lumber yard that we sell that material. I'd love to have actually a nursery as well associated with this. Here we get so many good plants coming in that can be nurtured back to health and be sold back again. My feeling is that things do not have to go to the grinder. Don't put them through the grinder. So this material then uh, is uh, going into a receiving building. Uh, we will have about an acre and a half uh, receiving building that's under negative pressure. All the emissions that come off the uh, material that's being delivered out there goes through a biofilter to clean up that air as well to have less impact on it to the environment. In that building, uh, we separate out uh, material that goes to the digester out here and then material that goes out to the field. Part of that is residual contamination here. Now, we are aiming for a 3% contamination, and there's a real reason for it. If I have a tipping fee of about $60 for material that comes into my facility, by the time I take garbage out and, and I take into account the people that are doing that, trucking it to the landfill, and the landfill in Sonoma County is, stands at right now at about $120 a ton, I'm forking out $180 a ton for garbage, but I took it in for only 60, so I'm farming backwards. If I don't keep that uh, garbage rate really low, I'm going to lose money. So what we're going to do, in, in addition to reaching people to get to the 75 diversion rate, at the same time, we're going to, um, sorry. Yeah. 
here we are. Uh, at the same time, we're going to also reach out to uh, educate them on getting clean material. Now, particularly when we get the material to our facility, we will know every truck that comes in. We will spot it what comes in. And if we see a, oh boy, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, you see material coming in, it doesn't make it. We go back to that neighborhood and actually going to do education to make it work. So back to the facility. So um, we will deliver material to the Laguna treatment plant. We're going to be right next to the water treatment plant uh, there. They compost their sewage sludge. They need yard to be as well. We provide them the material for that. They provide us with wastewater for makeup water. Then the yard debris goes to the composting facility out here. They do their own composting facility as well. And we're going to take some of the sludge that uh, they cannot compost and process that as well. And that then goes to the end market. The gas is being cleaned up. They have excess generators out there that actually we don't have to buy new generators. They're sitting on site already. Energy is being used over here. This facility is carbon negative, equivalent of taking 5,500 conventional cars off the road. That is not taking into account that we're probably going to produce also about three to four megawatts of electricity to run all our equipment that's electric from the solar panels so that uh, the only uh, fuel that we'll be using is for our rolling stock, the loaders that we have on site. So now we have our compost coming out and uh, I've been talking about the benefits of compost for a long time. And I said, you can download this, so I'm not going to go through all these uh, points out here. But this is basically what I'd be talking about. It was like about what, soil, con uh, soil conservation, nutrient conservation. And then I looked at soil health that started popping up a while uh, back. And if you look at the items for what is soil health, there's an absolute overlap with the benefits of compost. So compost really underlies how to create soil health. Uh, and that's basically from the carbon. Carbon is good for the soil, and we don't have a shortage of carbon. There's plenty in the atmosphere, and we need to draw it down. So through photosynthesis, we can draw it down, and then compost to bring it back to the soil and grow our carbon out there. Carbon farming is basically a plan where you put carbon at the center of your practices. So if you're a farmer, you don't even look at that point at, you know, so how am I going to grade my maximum crop out here? How am I going to uh, grow things well? you look at how can I maximize sequestering carbon in my soil. And if you look uh, later on at the benefits of the soil health, if you have that in place and you create more organic matter in the soil, the plants will grow by themselves. You don't even need the green thumb. It will happen automatically. Uh, one of the things that uh, I may get a grant to do uh, carbon gardening, uh, to do an education program on that. And the real reason why we want to do carbon gardening to me is People need to be aware of why this is good. And people are not aware of this here. And we can talk all we want about carbon farming out here, but people don't really understand this here. However, if I bring a program out there where I teach them how you can do this here in your backyard, that raises awareness. And with that, actually, I want to get an app going with as well, where they put in their address, square footage of uh, gardens that we have, how much compost they apply, if they, apply tr if they plant trees, shrubs, etc. And then we can actually do calculations from that, how much carbon will be sequestered and keep track of that, so we get a real map in the county of what's the carbon farming in the cities. Uh, quickly also, Al Gore does not have, when he does talks, look at it, he never talks about carbon sequestration. Now, what he talks about is how can we curb, you know, it's like the increase of CO2 in our atmosphere and make it go less steep. But we need to draw down. And we need to get politicians to be aware of this here. And this needs to become mainstream. So what I'd like to see is that actually carbon sequestration becomes a litmus test for any politician that will be elected. We need to ask him, you know, it's like, where do you stand and elect those people that are going to do something actively about that? This is about action here, right? So uh, making compost, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, this is really key to uh, carbon sequestration. You need a mature and stable compost. And unfortunately, when I look around in California, what compost is being made? Majority of compost facilities do not have a mature and stable compost. And so when you buy compost, make sure that you ask, is this compost manure stable? There are uh, lab tests for that that will show if that compost is indeed stable. I think that's key to carbon sequestration. And then lastly, it's like I look at you, it's like, what do people want? It has no importance what I think is good compost. What is important is what do people really need? And when I get people coming into the office, it's usually, well, I got 
bad soil. Well, what does that mean, bad soil? Well, they either have a clay soil that is just too hard to work, or they have a sandy soil that they call not fertile and it doesn't hold water. That's what I built my products around. And then I, the other one is, you know, do you have, do you grow things that have a high need for nitrogen, or do you grow natives and trees where you don't want to have lanky growth? Those also take different compost. So that's how I designed basically my line of compost to meet those demands. That's it. Thank you.